Hi, everybody. I am so looking forward to this show today. I have the strongest sense that it's going to be one of the most powerful and meaningful podcasts I have recorded in the six years I've been doing this. My guest is Dr. Melvin Morse, and does he have a story to tell? And it's a story about transformation, redemption, forgiveness, understanding, and everything he's learned and everything I've learned from him can change your life. Stick with us for the whole show because this is going to be filled with drama, surprises, and it's going to stretch you a little. It's going to force you to really question your own BS, your belief system. As you, uh huh, there it is. <laughs> it just came on camera. Man. Welcome, Melvin. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's just it's a, an honor, and a, I'm excited to be here. Well. I usually don't read the, the bios of people. I like that to come out in our talking. I also usually don't talk as much as I may talk today, but there are some stories about our meeting that I want to share, if you don't mind. Uh, I would like to start with a little background of how I first heard of you, okay? All right. You may have heard some of this, and I think when we first met, I shared it with you, but it's important just for the background of how, we, how I came to hear your current day story. I first heard of you and saw you, I didn't meet you that time, a good 10 years ago when we were both speaking at an afterlife conference in Virginia Beach, and you were a New oh. York fellow then. You remember that conference? I do. I, Raymond was there as well. Raymond, Dr. Raymond Moody. Yeah. Raymond Moody. I was very new on this journey. Not too many people knew me, but boy, they knew you. And you came in with an entourage and you had your family trailing behind you and you had people glomming onto you. There's Dr. Melvin Morris. He's a New York Times bestselling author. He's a near-death experience expert in NDEs for children. Do I have that right? Yeah. And you, I recognize your book. I bought your book and, uh, I don't think I got to go to your talk because it interfered with the workshop I was given. But that was my background to you. And I just was so impressed that you were like the headliner of this whole conference. So fast forward a few years and to my utter shock, I read in the newspaper that Dr. Melvin Morris had been convicted of a crime and was in prison. Was that a maximum security prison? We'll get into this shortly. Who was that a medium security prison? Medium security prison. So this is not some country club that prison the doctors go. No, far from it. Yeah. So uh, I don't want to go into the details now of what you were convicted of. Well, I should. All right. Yeah. It, it was for. Well, why don't you tell us what the conviction was for? I was convicted for child endangerment. Um, but there's getting around. Um, uh, I became a, an internet uh, sensation um, uh, because uh, I was accused of waterboarding uh, my um, uh, stepdaughter. Right. And a lot of this had to do with my near, near death research. Uh, it was uh, thought at the time that I was doing some sort of experiments uh, uh, on her. Uh, and uh, as you know, uh, Suzanne, as a critical care physician, uh, we did our near-death research at Seattle Children's Hospital over about a 15-year period of time. We worked in the intensive care unit uh, with the Human Subjects Review Board. You know, we had the highest ethical standards, uh, you know, obviously. Um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, I certainly learned how easily things can become distorted. Uh, and... But uh, fortunately for me, um, I learned. I learned that this that was my destiny. We we were going to was something. We, we're really going to dive into that, but I need to just. I I know that the second people heard. Wait, wait. Suzanne's guest was convicted of child endangerment, and the news said he waterboarded his stepdaughter. This man who was a, a physician and emergency room physician and help all these children with their near-death experience understanding. So imagine my surprise, everybody, when I went to be a keynote speaker at the International Association of Near-Death Studies, IANS, conference. I think it was two years ago now, year before last. And here I am, one of the headline speakers, and I look on the whole schedule of events, 
and Dr. Melvin Morse is one of the speakers. Now, I was sharing a hotel room with my assistant and my friend, Lynette, and I said, oh my gosh, Lynette, what is Ian's thinking? And I just thought, how can they do that? Okay, he served his sentence, but they really are going out on the limb bringing a convicted man who, who endangered his child. And then I stopped. Spirit spoke to me in that moment and they said, wait, get out of your head and into your heart. This is everything I've been teaching over the years, Melvin. And suddenly I knew, first of all, I, ends, I knew they wouldn't bring somebody if there wasn't another story. And I knew that newspapers lie. And I knew there had to be more than more to the story than I knew. So I, ha I had to run off at that moment. And I said, Lynette, Please see what you can find on the internet, not that we can trust it, about the most recent news about Dr. Morse, but I need to feel him with my heart. I, and I just said, no matter what you find, Lynette, no matter what anybody from Ian says, I because I didn't feel I could trust Ian's. Well, here I am, a keynote speaker. If they're going to bring in a convicted child abuser and dangerer, you know, I don't want to be part of this organization. That was my thought. But my soul was saying, let your, let your heart be your guide. So with that in mind, I go downstairs to do what I would think it was my time to speak. And you may remember this moment. I push the button for the elevator. The door comes open and there's one person in it and it's you. <laughs> and, and, I don't know what I must have looked like to you, but I can only imagine my face. You know, just I'm, I'm be a terrible poker player. I just look like, oh my god! And I and I looked at you and I said, I need to talk to you. Do you remember that? Actually, I very much remember it because I was very uh, nervous and, um, uh, you know, it was frankly, frankly a shame. You know, it, it was not an easy thing to go uh, to the IONS conference. I've lectured for IONS for 15 years. And Raymond Moody's my brother-in-law. And, you know, I've been involved in near-death research for uh, for, my, really for my entire career. Um, coming out of my, uh, you know, my work as a critical care physician. But to be convicted of a crime and as a pediatrician, be convicted of a crime against a child, you know, it just, it just as a, I felt ashamed and it, well, I was grateful that I uh, uh, wanted me to lecture, uh, but uh, I was not anticipating having to talk to anybody there. <laughs> and it was it, not about my crime or anything like that. You were the first person uh, to tell me that I needed to start to talk about this, okay. that I needed to give voice uh, to what I learned, both about myself and what I learned uh, from my time in prison, where I, you know, I spent most of my time uh, sharing with my fellow inmates what I knew about spirituality and meditation uh, and you know, such as that. Well, where, I, I see it as the spirit set up the way, literally, the doors open. And I could, it was almost like angels singing, this is a setup. So what thrilled me is you agreed. I said, when can we talk? Because I'm serious. I had to talk to you if I was going to you know, be part of this organization that you were clearly back a part of. And, and you said, well, how about you know, tonight? And I said, okay, 8 o'clock, where are we going to meet? Let's meet downstairs off to the side of the lobby because we didn't need to go to anybody's hotel room. Let's just go off to the side of the lobby there. And you showed up. I brought Lynette. But what cracked me up, Melvin, is you brought somebody with you for for what, safety? Crystal Burslock. She's the little girl that I resuscitated when she was seven years old and was the first person to have told me about her near-death experience. She patted me on the wrist uh, after we successfully resuscitated her. And she looked at me and she said, You'll see, Dr. Morris, heaven is fun. Heaven is fun. She, oh my God. She, she had told me about her own experience. She said, no, no, I wasn't dead. I wasn't dead at all. Some part of me was still alive. And, of course, I trained at Johns Hopkins as a critical care doctor. You know, I, you know, to me, when you're dead, you're dead. And yet to hear this little girl that we knew was at the point of death, uh, she couldn't have been any closer to death and still survived. 
And yet for her, well, she described her entire resuscitation to me. She described uh, incidental things that I said to the nurses. And then for her to, to, to look at me and pat me, you know, pat me on the wrist. So I felt I had to bring her along uh, just for uh, moral support. <laughs> that I, I don't know what, uh, uh, you know, Suzanne Giesman wants to talk to me about, but you know, I would sure appreciate it if you came and held my hand. But she's now an adult, right? It's not like your brain's still like living. Crystal, you know, she's now 45. Yeah. So I were lecturing together uh, about, uh, uh, you know, uh, her experience of being resuscitated and my experience of resuscitating her uh, from when she was seven years old. Well, so here you are. What is her name again? Crystal Merslock. No, that's right. I remember her well. I remember you showing up, and I thought that was so funny that you brought her for moral support. I didn't. I don't know if I was in commander mode, and I was really firm, but I was coming from the heart. And we we sat on just these two the, the couches and chairs off to the side in the lobby, down on, like on a lower floor. Nobody bothered us the whole time, which was stunning. Nobody stopped by and said, "Oh, you know, can I talk to you?" And we, I think we talked for a couple hours. And it was, I know it was helpful for both of us because it allowed you to see the importance in your message. It gave me aha moments that I have been sharing in my teaching ever since. But before we dive into that, because that's what we're going to share today and more, that deal with helping people with mediumship and understanding the greater reality and who we are, all those topics I said we're going to talk about, let's get to the bottom line about this crime, what happened and what happened afterwards about, you know, your, let me just go to the bottom line, your medical license has been reinstated. So everybody, clearly there is more to this story. Would you share it with us, Dr. Morse? Well, what I, I did is, so I don't, I don't want to, uh, because the thing, you know, that we'll get into later, I guess, is until you start to take responsibility for your life, you're not in control of your life. And... Yeah. Uh, you know, as long as I saw myself as a victim and as long as I saw, you know, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, that, that I was falsely accused and this sort of thing. I'm all, all that did was lead to bitterness. And it was my fellow prisoners, actually, uh, who first pointed me in the direction of, wait a minute, you know, take responsibility. And I did create a climate or was part of a climate in my household, which was not loving. Uh, you know, a a a, a stepchild doesn't, you know, just out of the blue accuse a step parent of a terrible crime unless she's angry, unless she doesn't feel like she's loved. And, uh, you know, that was, in fact, the case. Um, I was struggling with some medical issues, but I, you know, that that's an explanation, perhaps, uh, but that doesn't make any life any better for her. I love that. I love that you're not making excuses, but I do know you were on a medication that has since been banned because of the side, emotional side effects. Is that not correct? Yeah, that's uh, I was uh, uh, as part of my uh, work as a uh, critical care physician. I contracted hepatitis C, and at that time, the only treatment for it was a medication called interferon, which triggers sort of a bipolar state. And my stepdaughter had uh, thrown up on herself. Um, she had, uh, you know, uh, she was struggling with a uh, eating disorder and had deliberately thrown up on herself. And I did become angry. And I took her and just put her in a tub of water and, and rinsed her off. And that was terrifying for her. And she certainly, you know, at that time I weighed 250 pounds and she weighed 60 pounds. So I don't think that, Suzanne, that, that she cared that I was on a medication that was causing this. I think she was terrified, uh, and, uh, and rightfully so. Uh, however, you know, that then led to uh, that I was trying to waterboard her, that I was doing experiments on her. And then once this uh, gets, you know, to CNN, Nancy Gray, um, and, and gets on the Internet, uh, I, I've learned myself to take with a huge grain of salt uh, anything that uh, I now read on the internet uh, because it's so easy to see how things get blown out of proportion. Uh, fortunately for me, the jury uh, that uh, listened uh, to my case uh, didn't uh, buy any of it. Um, I was convicted of the crime, frankly, that I admitted uh, to. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the punishment was harsher than I expected, but... Uh, you know, that 
um, you know, that's that uh, I'm sure that uh, you know that's to be expected. Of course, I don't think I should add any punishment at all, and um, and I certainly am glad that I did because I learned a lot from it. I mean, from what you were saying, I, you described it perfectly. You know, I thought that I was the Doctor Morse who understood what the happens to us at the end of life, and that uh, we're here to learn lessons of love. And yet I hadn't learned any of those lessons of love myself until I actually had to learn them. And I learned them by spending two years in prison, listening to other men who had far worse issues than me and helping them also to find peace and transformation within them. And, and, and this, this is what... This is what I felt when we spent those two hours talking together. You're not just stating, yeah, I was reformed, I found love. No, you, from the man I saw at that conference to the person you are today, the man you are today, it, you, it's a transformation, and it's from what you're sharing with us now and are going to continue sharing throughout this program. It's genuine. It's possible for anyone. One of the things that struck me, you know, it's it's like everybody's nightmare to be institutionalized in some form. And here you go from the top of the rail, well known, respected in your profession, New York Times best selling author, and you are now in in a bay with what bunk beds, open, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I learned from Lynette you know, like there's nonstop screaming in prison. That's so, it. That's the thing. So, I learned from Lynette, who was a social worker, who had to go in prisons that evening, and she's talking to you, and she said, you know, how did you concentrate? There's what, what you said, nonstop screaming. Tell us about that first month. I just can't imagine, and what that one prisoner said to you after you'd been there a few weeks. So I was bitter and angry, and I felt that I had to... Um, and, you know, and I could, you know, all the people that had wronged me, you know, and it wasn't until I was there for about three or four weeks until the heroin addict that was at the bunk next to me looked at me and said, you know, Doc, you got to change your thinking. Says it, and he gave me a, a book that had been written in the 1800s called As a Man Thinketh. And he said, it's your thoughts that are holding you back, Doc. And, and this was you know, this was somebody that you know that frankly, there's no getting around it. You know, I thought the well, upper middle class physician. You know, I thought that uh, when I went to prison, I thought that you know I was better than them. You know that I would be you know spending my time with criminals. Instead, I learned that most of these people aren't criminals at all and that I had something to learn from them about forgiveness, about love, about transformation, and, and the way they live their lives. And the transformations I saw in them you know, taught me that everything that these children had told me was true, that we are here to learn lessons of love. And sometimes that involves going to prison. Sometimes that involves learning some very painful lessons of love. Because let's face it, you can't learn something unless first you fail. And you know, to fail at lessons of love, you know, comes out in things like being convicted of child endangerment, uh, comes out in being in situations in which you are falsely accused of things. These are these things that we are co-creators in our own universe. Um, we, we do create what happened to us. And it was an inmate that told me that first. It was uh, a gentleman named uh, Mr. Owens was uh, one of them. Uh, and he had said to me, he looked at me and he said, you know, Doc, you got to start taking responsibility for what you did before you can learn to forgive yourself. He said, I know you didn't do what, you know, the, you know, the media, the internet says you did, but you did do something. And until you come to grips with that, then you're not going to be able to free yourself from bitterness. And he was the first person to teach me to meditate. And he said that uh, when you meditate, that's, that's your chance to start to understand suffering. 
I didn't Sorry, that understand that. your question. I thought that you went in there as a big meditator and you taught them. It's true. I did know how to meditate. And I had meditated uh, and removed, which is sort of an advanced form of meditation, etc. But I was not of a mindset to do anything when I went in there. I was just in a, in a state of despair. And, and was, the phrase that I was hoping you'd share is, didn't one of the, the men come up to you and say, we need to do an intervention? Intervention, that's what it is. Right, that, that, that is what this uh, uh, yeah, you know, drug addict had said to me. We got to do an intervention on you, Doc. Because you weren't eating, you weren't interacting with anyone, right? Just lying there. And he said, you know, that's what that's what his message was. There was a couple of them, and Mr. Owens was one. And then the gentleman that you uh, mentioned, uh, you, uh, he had already come to terms with his own heroin addiction and had already told me that his efforts at meditation had led to him uh, uh, at least freed himself uh, from uh, his uh, cravings for heroin. And sure enough, uh, you know, six years later, he is not addicted to heroin, and he's a plumber's helper uh, working in Georgetown, Delaware. So, you know, I started to see for the first time that these things, that, you know, they were in theory for me. You know, they're the kinds of things that I lectured about, the kinds of things that I taught other people about. But I'm not sure I ever understood them until I actually saw them in practice. And it was the inmates that first taught me about spirituality. Um, you know, in the sense of the practical aspects of it, you know, how sharing with me how it changed their lives. Uh, the gentleman I was telling you about, Mr. Owens, um, he said to me, he said, I'm a heart man. And uh, the, he described himself as a drug dealer, which spent most of his uh, life in prison. And yet his children, one of uh, just graduated from nursing school, one was a manager uh, for a uh, local food chain, and one was a businessman that owned a string of laundromats. And I asked him, you know, how did that happen? How, you know, how did your... And he said, through forgiveness, he said, I learned to forgive myself for beating them when they were kids, for, you know, not being a good father. And when I came to confront that through meditation, because meditation is the process of listening to yourself. And meditation is the process of starting to learn about yourself. People, I think, mistakenly think it's about quieting your thoughts. It's not. It's about listening. And first, listening to yourself. And he told me I started to learn that I wasn't a good father. And I wanted to be one. And that tiny little change can make such a huge difference. You know, and that's what I learned in talking to Mr. Owens, and that's what I learned from the young man uh, who was a plumber who told me he had to do an intervention to teach me how to think so that I would start to think in a healthy, healing way instead of in an angry, better way. And that these things are they're small changes, and yet they make an incredible difference. And we're going to dive into that so people can make these little small changes and that's, this is the the one point that I've been sharing with people that you taught me about meditation is these men, you started teaching your fellow inmates who were willing, who wanted to meditate, to meditate one minute at, at a time, one minute at a time. And you told me, and it stunned me, there was one man, maybe it's the one you just talked about, who had been addicted to heroin and the cravings continued even while he was in prison for years, craved heroin every day, but after meditating one minute a day or at a time, the cravings stopped. How could that happen? I mean, it does seem impossible. Uh, and yet, when I explain it, you know, and when I saw it for myself, it makes perfect sense. So the, the gentleman you're talking about is a, a guy named Zachary Price. And uh, he uh, asked me um, to uh, to share with your um, uh, listeners that he said that he wants to share with everyone simply meditating. 
in his case, starting with a minute a day and never really getting more than 10 minutes a day. The, in him, finding the mainstay of an inner quality that changed his life. He's a gentleman that uh, at age 13 started using his mother's pain pills, uh, became addicted uh, to narcotics, uh, certainly by age 14, uh, spent uh, most of uh, his uh, teenage years and young adult years in prison, um, and uh, described himself when I met him as an angry, bitter man. Um, and uh, he, he th this is his home words uh, after um, uh, working with me with meditation, is that he said that he learned the necessary uh, skills to build on his soul. So, so how can this happen from just one minute? Well, first of all, uh, you know, I sympathize with everyone trying to meditate because usually we're trying to meditate in a way that was, you know, was taught 3,000 years ago when there wasn't as much noise and people were used to sitting without chairs. <laughs> you know, so the first step is to become comfortable and it start to listen to your environment. To, to not try to screen things out. At least, I mean, at prison, you can't. But, you know, I think that this applies to anybody is, you know, you hear a little noises or the refrigerator kicks on or you don't feel quite as comfortable uh, as you should. So simply take inventory of yourself. And sure, I'm feeling very comfortable. You know, it does kind of hurt to sit this way. Well, let me scrunch around and get more comfortable and let me hear what the noises are in this environment. So we can start to learn what's going on now so we can then hear what else is going on. And then one minute of meditation is plenty because you're starting to listen to yourself. It's not about clearing the mind. It's about hearing your mind because the immediate next thought is, well, who's doing the listening? And so that, right, that plants a tremendous seed. So you start to learn that this internal narrator that we have, that's constantly talking and telling us, you know, you really screwed up. You should never have done that. You know, why did you, or, or the various voices in our head that are saying, you know, you're not good enough, you're a failure, etc. That is not who you are. Human beings have a second stream of consciousness in them that is mostly silent. And that's the part of you that's listening. And once you start to listen to this sort of internal voice, you start to learn, wow, something else is going on. Something else is listening. And that is all that it takes to plant that seed that will then start to grow. Because you'll start to think, boy, I sure sound angry. I sure seem like I'm coming back again and again to why this person said this or, or why I said the wrong thing in that situation. Boy, I seem to really be perseverating about that. And maybe that's enough for that day. And that's, that'll take you a minute or two. Because we're trying to tune into a place that transcends time and space. Like children that had the near-death experience say to me, could have lasted a minute. It could have lasted my whole life. So start with a minute. You know, and, and then build on that. Maybe get to three minutes. Maybe get to five minutes. Uh, I can tell you that Zachary never got more than 10 minutes a day. And yet he had the discipline to at least work on it for 10 minutes a day. And it did not take him long. He told me it took 32 days before suddenly he woke up and he did not crave heroin. And I had not known this about heroin addiction, but uh, the heroin addicts, you know, I mean, we think we're locking up these horrible criminals. We think that we're locking up, uh, we're mostly locking up heroin addicts and people with post-traumatic stress disorder and, yeah, and diagnosed mentally ill, you know, or veterans uh, who are struggling uh, with uh, the, you know, the, the various things that they've had to do and had to see. Make a point. I want to make a point that you made that, that evening when we talked and you've made it 
with me since then that there are definitely people who deserve to be in prison. You're not saying that at all. Absolutely not. They, and those who are in prison, by and large, deserve to be there. I'm not. It, it's a. It's a. It, it's sort of like when I look at the public discourse about prison. It seems to me, uh, having since I didn't know anything about it either before I went to prison, it seems to me that both sides have it wrong. Um, most of the men in prison have done things that they deserve to be there. There's no question about it. And they they agree to that. The problem is they are going to get out. We can't lock them up forever, and they don't have the skills to to commit crimes, and they they don't have the spiritual resources. They they don't have the understandings to not commit crimes. Well, I'd like to get back into this gentleman you were talking about, who the realization he had after 32 days and why that changed him. So suddenly for him to wake up and crave heroin was to him validation that this technique worked because he could actually see for himself something that had changed. And it was simply by listening to himself by listening to his pain, by listening to his anger, by listening to his fears, then starting to understand that someone else was listening, that, that, that there was more to him than just anger and pain and uh, failure, that there was more to him than that. It's when we learn to get beyond the story, because this is a challenge, isn't it, that, that so many people... They're stuck in their story and, and can remain stuck in victim mode and lack of forgiveness. What happened to him on the 32nd day was he suddenly realized he could rewrite his story, that his story was not one of failure, but his story was one of having to learn something, that he was in prison to finally learn how to control his emotions and to finally learn how to control his feelings instead of having his feelings control him. And again, simply listening to his feelings was enough to realize that he could control them. Because after he, somebody was separate from his feelings. And that's what he came to realize. And it didn't take much. It took him five, ten minutes a day if he missed a day, he missed a day, just went at it another day and just kept at it and kept at it. And suddenly something happened. And that it's, it's no doubt it's transformative. And as you said, it comes from the rewriting of his story. And that's what he told me. He said that he no longer saw himself as, uh, as a victim. He saw himself as taking six years to learn how to overcome his heroin addiction. But uh, that seems like such a small thing, and yet it means everything. You know, that's why, you know, six, seven, ten years later, he is not relapsed. And in the state of Delaware, you have a 75% chance of going back to prison within three years of being released. So the fact that, uh, I don't know, you know, a dozen or so of the men that I worked with are still on the outside is quite remarkable. I hope you're working on that book we talked about. Well, <laughs> That there is so much to be learned from, uh, you know, for, from talking to people who have failed and then come to march with their failure. It frankly has to do uh, with learning about whether you want to call it God, some sort of universal consciousness, some sort of spirituality. But there can be no transformation until you start to understand that. And that is inside each one of us. I, I want to move on to remote viewing and, and the realization that that brought to some of your fellow inmates. But one other point, the one that I've been teaching is when, when you and Lynette were talking about the constant noise, the constant screaming 24-7 in prison. Uh, my question was, you're teaching these men to meditate. How do they focus and what do you how do they do this? And your statement was, you learn to notice what stands out. 
from the noise. That was the biggest aha moment for me because that's what mediums do. Our minds are busy. We set the intention to connect with a loved one across the veil. And in spite of any distraction, we are focused on what stands out from the noise. It, it's, it's brilliant, that statement. And learning just not to meditate, but then to learn to listen to that inner voice. But again, it's not, it's not difficult as long as you spend your time listening to what is there around you. You hear the constant screaming, you, which to me, which I've learned is not different than hearing the hum of the refrigerator. You know, after a while, you start to identify, yes, that's that sound. Yes, that's that sound. Yes, that's that my pain in, the sh in my shoulder. That's my feeling uneasy. That's my anxiety. That's my wondering if this will ever work and what's the point of all of this. And then another voice intrudes. And that voice saying something like, you're loved. You know, yeah. And then suddenly you know, wait a minute, that did not come from my internal narrator. That came from my inner source. Here, to listen, and, you know, it's not, it's not going to just happen. Uh, and yet it's easier than you think. The transformations that I've seen, uh, astonishing. Um, the, you know, that just, uh, the, so. You led groups, right? In prison. Not everybody, right? Not everybody's on board, but you would have regular gatherings, right? Of meditators. To, to, to be in prison their whole life. Um, I mean, that's a, the, the idea that people actually want to be in prison. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure that there are some. Um, and, as, and as we were saying before, there's many people who need to be in prison. Um, by and large, most of the people in prison uh, are, uh, you know, they don't have the skills. Uh, they're overwhelmed. Uh, but, uh, you know, have undiagnosed problems. Um, and uh, they, they don't know how to think differently. So people said this to me all the time, you know, once, you know, because I started working with one man or two men, it was, it was not unusual but for people to want to learn. And they didn't want to just even, I was always amazed, I always get like the most basic books that I had on, you know, meditation or whatever. Like, no, Doc, we will bet the, the, the uh, Tibetan the actual Tibetan uh, uh, book, it, uh, you know, has all the lectures on exactly how to meditate that was written a thousand years ago. Uh, that was actually one of the most uh, borrowed books uh, from uh, my collection. So these are thirsty sponges. They they want to think differently, and they just they they just don't know how. Uh, they've never been exposed to it. But that doesn't mean then. They're not dangerous, damaged people. That means that they are damaged, dangerous people in at, at times, and yet they don't want to be that way. They want to learn to be different, and uh, certainly I saw it again and again. Um, that uh, you know, on my website, it's uh, meltonmorsemd.com. Uh, I've got a number of the prisoners' uh, testimonies, um, but uh, there is one a gentleman. Uh, that uh, I want to share with you, uh, who has just told me so uh, clearly um, that uh, by learning to remove view particularly, uh, which is a remote viewing, you know, to me, it's, a, it's sort of like a dummy down form of mediumship. I'm going to say, because we just, I want to hear that story, but we've, we've mentioned remote viewing a couple of times, and we need to just for, explain for those who are not familiar with it, that you are an expert in remote viewing and you started teaching the inmates how to remote view. And I'd love to talk about the effect of that and some other great teaching that I gleaned from that. W would you quickly in a nutshell say, what is remote viewing? And then we definitely don't want to forget this gentleman's testimonial. So remote viewing is the ability to gain information from the universe, from this universal source of knowledge. And, you know, 
it's we say these things so easily. We say there's a teacher within each one of us. Well, if that's true, then, then we should be able to ask this teacher, uh, you know, questions. You know, you you do this when you contact, uh, uh, you know, entities or the departed spirit of a loved one, you know, etc. This is a very dummy down form of that. This is really just getting a uh, very uh, prosaic information. Um, so a non-target on the other side of the world look like. Um, and, you know, this information is very validating because once you successfully do it, you realize that all the other intuitions that you have are correct as well. You know, specifically, what I worked with inmates is a meditative technique called Tangla in which you actually try to appreciate the suffering of others. Well, this sounds like it's just sort of an intellectual exercise or a philosophical exercise until you actually success your remote view, until, you know, you're given a, you know, a target across the world and you're able to identify what it is, then suddenly you realize, well, wait a minute, if that's true, then my ability to assess the suffering that I've caused other people is correct as well, that I am actually feeling their suffering. I, I'm not uh, just, uh, you know, making something up. And that we do actually have a teacher who's within us. And that the, um, well, the gentleman I'm telling about, uh, a, a self-described sociopath um, who uh, says that uh, he uh, deserves to be at prison, um, he, at age 40, was in uh, prison for uh, 12 years uh, for uh, domestic assault uh, and other violent uh, activities. And uh, when I met him, uh, he was ready to commit suicide. Uh, he had decided uh, to, to just uh, end his life. And again, starting with the one minute of meditation and five minutes of meditation. And then proceeding to something like, well, let's see. If we have a source of information within us, let's see if we can contact that source of information and learn something verifiable from it. And most people, by the way, have had these types of experiences and they usually dismiss them and say, oh, well, I was crazy or I just had some crazy dream that came true. Instead of seeing it as a validating experience, yes, you do have a connection to a source of wisdom. And he finally uh, wrote to me and he said, I recommend to anybody who has doubt of the next life or the last life to sit still and fully appreciate this one. And that's what he's talking about. By sitting still, he means to sit still for a minute, for three minutes, to five minutes, to listen to what's going on in this life. And he said by simply doing that, that he learned that I am so much more than just a person. I'm a magical, spiritual human being. It's an extraordinary expression from a man who's lived a life of crime, and uh, is uh, you know, he says I'm I'm I am what society calls a sociopath because I don't really care about my life of crime. Oh, and and yet, after weeks, months of very simple meditative techniques, but coupled with remote viewing, which does provide some validation, to then suddenly realize, wow, I am a spiritual being. I'm here learning a lesson of love, which is what the children originally had told me about their near-death experience. When, you know, when I studied children that said to me things like, after we resuscitated and they'd say, that was weird. You just sucked me back into my body. And they would say that the, what they learned from their experience is they're here to learn a lesson of love. And yet here's a heart and criminal reaches the same conclusions after some simple meditative techniques. You know, this is the moment for Lynette that she remembered from that conversation we had at the hotel was when you shared that one of the men you taught to remote view, the first time he saw that he had correctly gained information about some picture that was in a sealed envelope by just going within that he started crying. 
And she said, for everybody, there's this bolt of lightning moment. I call it the no other explanation moment, a moment of truth. When you suddenly realize, wait a minute, this life isn't all there is. That moment right there is transformative. And you provided that with remote viewing. Now, not everybody listening to this is going to be able to, you know, take courses and learn to remote view. And I've been thinking about this, Suzanne. What what I would like is for people to realize that they are having these experiences. I, I work with people, it seems like, you know, at least once a week that tell me, you know, I did have a dream that came true. And yet I never believed it until, you know, I successfully learned to review. But since not everybody is going to learn to review, um, maybe we should take the other point of view and start to start to trust our dreams and start to trust our intuitions and start to trust these crazy thoughts that other people have dismissed or, you know, or, or, or the things that we write off as coincidences. Um, even I've, uh, my mom has been leaving me dimes. My mom has passed. I'm, she's been leaving me dimes. And I put them off as coincidences until suddenly I realized, wait a minute, you know, my mom knows me. She knows that if she appeared before me in spirit form, I would probably go that sedation. You know, she knows I need something tangible. But it really wasn't until the COVID, uh, uh, you know, um, epidemic that and where we never carried any money. And yet still dimes were showing up at my house uh -huh. that, you know, that I had the courage to believe what I knew must be true. And I think that that's happening uh, with uh, most people. I think, uh, you know, certainly we know that uh, from uh, various uh, public opinion polls, et cetera, that most people have had profound spiritual experiences. But in our society, we tend to dismiss them. So don't wait to learn to remove you to start to trust your inner uh, instincts and your inner teacher, that's for sure. But you're absolutely right. Um, well, uh, uh, the most dramatic one, I taught uh, this gentleman uh, he was an enforcer for one of the, um, uh, there's various uh, organizations uh, in prisons that uh, lend out, uh, uh, you know, commissary items or, uh, you know, they'll they'll buy you uh, uh, potato chips as long as you promise to then pay back, you know, two bags of potato chips, et cetera. So organizations like that need enforcers, obviously. And this gentleman was one of them. And I taught him to review. Yeah. Um, his uh, target was uh, uh, these uh, people wearing jetpacks who were flying up in the air. So somebody has put a picture of people wearing jetpacks flying in the air in a sealed envelope, and the the people remote viewing don't know it, and they use a process that many people use to determine what is on that photo, right? I was working with a uh, woman... Um, Who's a medium? Uh, her name's Isabel uh, Shavatan Savreda, and she would bail us these uh, sealed envelopes into prison, uh, so that neither I nor the inmates would know what our targets were. And it was so funny because uh, eventually the prison uh, came to uh, help us with this. Um, initially, You're talking about trust. Yeah. They trusted you so much they stopped opening the envelopes, right? They, the first time that they came in. I was still getting handcuffed, of course, and uh, taken in uh, before the, uh, the lieutenant. And they angrily, you know, what are these pictures? And you're getting mailed into prison. Um, but uh, after I explained to them, uh, they started laughing. And that after that, uh, the, these uh, envelopes were called my special envelopes and were, were not opened by the prison censors, which is, which is sort of a miracle in itself. Um, it, it really, I think it really showed that I think everybody understood that I was there doing good work. And, so tell us uh, about the, the gentleman with the jetpack photo. You know, um, he, uh, he, he, he says to me, flying, I feel like I'm flying in the air, but Walmer is pushing me up. And so then I showed him the uh, pictures uh, in which he was on a jetpack. He leaped backwards and then came over for his chair and shouted, there must be a God after all. So he immediately made the association that he could not have gotten that information 
unless it came through a spiritual uh, booth. What happened to him was he immediately quit his job. You know, and again, this is not, uh, you know, this is not. Uh, you know, I mean, as I've been, he quit then. He quit his job as being an enforcer. And his uh, demeanor so changed that when his mother died uh, six or eight months later, uh, he was permitted to go to her funeral. And that's extremely unusual. Only the most uh, trusted uh, and, um, uh, you know, well-behaved prisoners are permitted to go uh, to a funeral on the outside. Uh, the, the, you know, that's, that's very unusual. And yet, simply by learning to remove you and then back in, making that association, yes, there is a spiritual reality. This is called the wake up call. And this is what this awaken the way teaching that I share is when we come to know we're not only human and we're part of one big connected web. And the healing creative force of the universe is love. This is what you are teaching with remote viewing, with meditation. Not everybody needs to have that wake up moment. We can get it by just educating ourselves and, and coming to know in the heart what the soul already knows. Soul already knows. But Suzanne, when you see it with men who are in the most dire circumstances, lives that frankly, at least I, as a you know upper middle class, a white physician cannot imagine. Uh, and yet to see the power of transformation for them, when they suddenly understand, wait a minute, my life was not a simple life of criminal behavior, but it was a life in which I was struggling to learn lessons of love, failing to be sure, and yet still learning. And many of them, by the way, you know, they, they, to give you an illustration of how profound uh, their lessons of love are, is they don't necessarily see this, or typically don't see it, as a ticket uh, to then, well, I should be released. You know, um, one gentleman, uh, he taught me a lesson of forgiveness uh, that um, I want to just quickly share with you. Uh, he uh, told me that uh, he was uh, also a heroin addict, and his uh, the, the way he supported himself was uh, he worked for his father uh, in a home improvement company, and, and uh, while he was on site, he would steal stuff uh, from uh, their clients, and uh, he was eventually arrested, um, went to prison for twelve years uh, for for this. Um, now, his uh, one of his uh, uh, victims was a woman. Uh, he had stolen uh, her uh, uh, wedding ring from her husband, uh, who had been there. Uh, they had been married for fifty years, and he stole uh, their wedding ring. And uh, this woman, uh, while he was in prison, uh, called up uh, his father and asked him to come over to do another home improvement job. But when he came over, she said to him, "You know, I really don't have a job for you. I have something I want to tell your son." And I want him to know that I forgive him. Hmm. That um, when I read about his story and I read what he was struggling with, I had 50 wonderful years with my husband. You know, the ring was just a symbol of that. And I did not want his stealing my, you know, my precious wedding ring from, you know, my husband who, you know, it had passed uh, to be part of uh, his criminal conviction. And, you know, I had asked the prosecutors uh, to not use that as evidence against him. And I wanted you to know that I forgive your son. And he, the father then told the son that in prison. And that profoundly changed that young man's life. And uh, the, yeah, he was changed. You know, he now he shifted into uh, helping me with meditation, uh, working uh, with uh, you know, the younger prisoners, etc., and yet I said to him, I said, you know, so do you think that this means that you should, you know, get early parole or whatever? He said, absolutely not. He said, I have to pay for what I did. It's wonderful that she forgave me. That teaches me to forgive myself. And yet I also must bear responsibility for what I did. And so that, that sense of taking responsibility, which was one of the first things that I learned when I went to prison. I can't just say, oh, wow, I, you know, 
I was done wrong. These people, you know, this, that, and the other. You've got to take responsibility. And that sometimes involves serving your time. That's for sure. Yeah. Yet, yet we're here to learn lessons of love. This is a spiritual life we're living. So, you know, that might be the best, uh, at least it was for me. It, you know, I, I don't think I could have progressed spiritually had I not gone to prison. Wait, now there's something that bears hearing, doesn't it? Instead of looking back, you, you, re you really show that you learned that lesson that, of moving beyond victimhood. I don't think I could have learned the lessons of love without going to prison. But we are in a prison of our own making when we don't realize we are not only these bodies and this story. Yes, that's beautifully said. That summarizes, yeah, what, what I learned is that, that we all have stories that we imprison ourselves with. Frankly, I was imprisoning me myself with the story of, I was the great Dr. Morris who wrote the best-selling books and was, you know, uh, had the great ideas and, you know. Excellent that was a, that Yeah, was not just the bad stories. It's any story that makes us think we're only human and we're not all connected at a deeper level. Such a good point. Yeah. yeah. That I'm more important than you or I'm better than you. or, or it, mm, it, it goes, it's, why this is, I knew this was going to be a great conversation. That's uh, why when you said earlier, you said, well, I thought that you knew everything about meditation and so you went to prison to teach them that would never have worked <laughs> i would not be talking to you today if that's the attitude that i had taken i took the attitude of why did this horrible thing happen to me uh, i'm bitter i'm angry what about this little girl you know i'm blaming a 20 year old dream Actually, i mean think about it. you know that's how you know, distorted you can get, uh, you know, when you're so defensive and so certain that you're right. And no, it's, I had to go to prison to learn lessons of love from hurting criminals, from uh, people who had already learned the lessons that I needed to learn. And it, it, it wasn't until then that I realized, well, the men themselves told me, they said, Doc, you have too much knowledge. You know, you have to now start sharing your knowledge. Yeah, you know, the, the, think about it, Suzanne. You know, most of the people in prison are, you know, young black males. And, and yet, who you know, I have very little in common with. And yet, uh, by the time I left prison, um, you know, I felt that, they, you know, I was uh, a, a mentor and, um, uh, you know, someone that, that they could learn from, someone that they said to me, you know, you know, we appreciate what you have to share with us, uh, which is not an easy thing to do. You know, an upper middle class physician and an inner city, um, uh, you know, young, you know, black male. We, you know, we don't necessarily instantly come together. And yet we did because we saw we had so much to teach each other. Yeah, that's, uh, wow. So these lessons of love, I, I I hope this doesn't get too personal, but what is your relationship now with the daughter that was the whole, the whole interaction led to all of this? Excellent. You know, uh, you know, again, once I gave up my anger and my bitterness and started to realize, wait a minute, you know, this is a 12 year old girl. I mean, where are the adults? It was up to us to create an environment she felt safe, but she felt loved. It's not for us to, um, you know, to, 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 you know, why did you say this? Why did you say that? You know, that's it. So uh, she's now um, in her early 20s. Um, she has a daughter, uh, my grandchild, that uh, she uh, has allowed me uh, to say is my grandchild when uh, I go visit uh, her, you know, my grandchild comes running to me and I pick her up and, you know, hug her and, and love her. As she has uh, recanted her accusations, you know, not that that means anything legally. It meant a lot to the medical board, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Right? 
Right. But again, the recantation doesn't come until I recant it, until I'm able to say, wait a minute, you know, this was not your fault. That only then can there be that sense of healing and that sense of safety and that sense of trust to be able to then say, you know, because when we talk about learning lessons of love, these are non judgmental lessons. And that's a very hard thing for us to do because in order for us to learn lessons, we have to judge. And yet there has to be an aspect in which we don't judge. And that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, the power of meditation. Because it's that process of meditation when you hear yourself thinking. That's when the non-judgmental part comes in and you actually hear yourself I sound angry. Oh, I sound defensive. Oh, I seem to be thinking the same thoughts again and again and again. That's the, uh, I was just making a note earlier to put it into terms of frequently get off the stage and go up to the balcony where you are the neutral observer of the role you're playing. Yeah. Because there are then connects you with that inner teacher, that inner spirit. Because that then allows you to start thinking, well, who, who's doing the thinking now? <laughs> who, who's, who's, who's looking? Who's doing the observing? And that you realize that you're not alone. Yeah. That that something else is there observing with you. And this is a, it's easy. Um, but you have to put the time to it. I yeah, your turns to be patient. That's right. One minute a day, three minutes a day. Yeah. Um, I want to, before I, I, I lose this thought that's been floating around here, you've been talking so much about forgiveness. And it was another one of my podcast guests who gave me one of the best definitions I've ever heard of forgiveness. Forgiveness, if, if only I could remember who it was. I'm sorry, I can't give that attribution. But she said, forgiveness is cutting the cord that holds you prisoner to the other person, right? You we, we blame, 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 but you don't realize you're stuck. You're like a prisoner to them now because you're not willing to forgive. It's not saying what they did was right or wrong. It's just because you're, you haven't given that forgiveness, you're just bound. So that's what the, that uh, process of Tom Glenn is about, is when you start to understand the other person's suffering, that doesn't mean that you cause the suffering. That doesn't mean that you're a bad person because of the suffering. But I could never have understood what was going on with my stepdaughter until I understood her suffering. Stop blaming myself for it because all that then leads to defensiveness in that to try to maximize, you know, what she's going through. Regular say, Let's get her suffering. Now everything's more understandable. And then it allows me to then say, so what could I have done differently? And how did I contribute to this? And what what part did I play in it? And you're not going to understand that until you understand how the other person's suffering. And I have, you know, it, when you see these things happen in, People who, I, I'm glad what you said earlier about, you know, these people belong, well, these people, you know, they, they're my fellow inmates. Um, but many of them belong in prison. And one gentleman in particular uh, is, uh, he's a drug dealer. And uh, he, uh, one of his uh, clients didn't pay up. And so he pistol whipped them in front of his uh, family. So, you know, obviously that's a person that has to be in prison. And for most of the time that I knew him, um, he and the, you know, fellow inmates all agreed that he had to do that. You know, that was his business. Well, yeah, you know, that, I mean, what do you expect? The, the person to pay up. Um, but today he did say to me, he said, I have to learn to think differently. You know, I can't remain enmeshed in this way of thinking because I'm just going to come back to prison again and again. And, you know, once you've committed three crimes, um, uh, you know, in most states of the country, um, 
that you're going to be in prison for really an extended period of time. And, and they're aware of that. So and what so I described with him, you know, the moving on and changing the thoughts. If I go back to just before you told that story, you used the word wow, and then you used the word how. And I've heard you talk about moving from wow to how. Is that what you were talking about? So the wow is the insights that, you know, successfully reviewing that's the wow you know or having a dream that comes true that's the wow or with a gentleman like this um you know starting to work with him on trusting his own intuition and realizing that he has an intuition and realizing that he has even an inner life that's the wow you know that he goes wow you know that that this is really true the, the, but then the how comes when he starts to then think, what about those other people within in the room when I was, uh, you know, assaulting, uh, you know, his uh, drug dealing? Uh, uh, what about the teenage girl who was in the room that witnessed him? And one day he was on the phone with his own daughter. And this, again, after uh, working with him with meditation, and starting to think about, so what do you think other people were thinking? Just tiny thoughts like that. He was on the phone with his own daughter. And that's when it happened to him. They suddenly burst into tears and started crying and saying, now I realize that I frightened that little girl as much as my daughter is now frightened that I'm in prison. And then something's going to happen to me that other people actually have feelings that affect my life and that I actually affect other people's feelings. In the context of somebody who's, you know, really, you know, I mean, I said, we, we use terms like sociopath, but none of us are, are you know, are in stone. Uh, you know, he was not a sociopath once he had uh, this insight that he caused as much pain to his, uh, you know, to the family of his victim uh, as his daughter felt when she was struggling with why he was in prison. And that's enough, you know, that's enough to change him. And he was profoundly changed. And yet, again, he didn't think he should be released from prison for it. He had hope, though, that he would not be coming back. That was the first time I'd ever heard uh, him speak of that sort of hope. You know, most of, uh, you know, he mostly just thought, well, I'm eventually going to do this again. I'll eventually be back in prison. He did not have that opinion uh, after uh, his uh, transformative insight. Wow. Ooh, you heard a lot. It's good. It's very good stuff. I hope that people will be rewinding, rewinding, and going back and listening. There's so much here. There's a lifetime wisdom that will change people's lifetime. I know you had several stories. You've been looking off to the side and getting the stories. I don't want to end and have you say, oh, but I wanted to tell that story. Have we covered the stories that are most... I wanted to tell. Let me see. Well, the power of listening. And, you know, I just... There's other things that I've uh, found that I just I would like to share. Maybe they're not quite of a spiritual nature, but I would like to share these uh, with uh, people anyway. Because, as, you know, from what I learned, uh, people in prison are going to get out. If we were to protect them, to protect society, we have to start to treat them differently. From a that we feel sorry for them point of view, not that they had terrible childhood. So, oh my gosh, you know, we should cut them with some slack. Actually, if they've had terrible childhoods, that probably means that they don't have uh, the types of skills and the types of spiritual insights that most of us have, you know, just from going on camping trips with our fathers and, uh, you know, playing uh, sports and all those uh, character building things that most of us have that frankly, many people in prison don't have. But that just means that they need to learn those things. So I, here's just I wanted to share this with you. 
that so many people in prison, particularly men, remember that when we grieve, we're angry. And just as I saw such tiny transformations or huge transformations from things like teaching meditation, sometimes just teaching that grief can cause such pain, such anger, in itself can be transformative. Like thinking in particular of uh, one a young man, uh, he did come to me. He was one of these ones as a uh, lived in the inner city of Wilmington, Delaware, came to me, he said that he said, uh, some of the other uh, men said, I should come and talk to you, uh, Doc, uh, that uh, you might be able to teach me something. And when he was 14 years old, uh, he was uh, driving uh, with his brother uh, in downtown Wilmington, and he looked over and his brother's head exploded um, from, you know, being shot by a drive-by uh, shooting. And he did not realize that he had been grieving for his brother's death for the last eight years of his life. All he knew is he was consumed with anger. And simply, through three talks of maybe, I don't know, less than half an hour each time, talking to him about grief, about how angry he must be, changed him. He no longer was angry meaning he was no longer getting in trouble, meaning he was no longer going to solitary, uh, meaning uh, that uh, he was starting to get along with other people. Because think how it, how it changed him. We're framed of angry people. You know, a young, hostile, angry, large, black young man is going to be treated differently than a man who seems vulnerable, is crying and is sad. And just that transformation alone then changed how people saw him, which then led to greater transformation. I don't know whether he's, you know, I, I've not uh, talked to him since I was in prison with him. But I, I know that. I need to just clarify. So, did you just teach him to feel the sadness, to acknowledge that and allow him to be sad? Exactly. Whew. It's different. Then, then, I mean, just teaching medical students the five stages of grief. Huh. When, you know, did, you, did it ever occur to you that maybe you're so angry all the time and that you're always wanting to punch somebody out because of what happened uh, with you and your brother? Did it ever occur to you? And I said, no. I mean, I think, you know, what, those two things have to do with each other. You know, the, you know, when I started working with him, you know, why would that have anything to do, you know, has nothing to do with it. The, you know, the guards are, you know, just, you know, expletive deleted. And, uh, you know, everybody else on this uh, cell is out to get me and they all hate me. And not seeing any relationship between those two things and not understanding that if you don't come across, you know, as, as an angry, hostile person. Um, yeah, I have to think, I got to tell you something, because. Dr. Morris, I just came for the doctor, just a routine thing. And I got in the car just before this this interview here. And I got in the car next to somebody. And it was a young black man playing really loud music with all kinds of expletive demeanor. The F words, boom, and out of that car. And it was just angry music. And, I, you know, aren't we all grieving the loss of awareness of who we really are? Everybody, if we if we just everybody wants love, I'm not making excuses for anything. But if we could just all see anger and find compassion and help others find what they're grieving, really, that would change our world. This is huge. What you just said. Yeah, I've seen a lot of that at prison because the what you you've identified it as is the loss of who we really are. Um. Nobody is born to be in prison. Uh, you know, I suppose there are a handful of people that are born as uh, sociopaths, etc. Uh, they are not in medium security prison, so I can't say that I met them. Um, the people that I met, uh, by and large, uh, did not uh, see this as where they wanted to go in life. They're all grieving, and uh, they are, yeah, men, you know, are angry. We are grieving often. 
internalizing it, often are blaming themselves for it. And so I can imagine that these types of uh, techniques would work just as well that with whoever's grieving, because so often there's a disconnect, uh, you know, particularly with women who then turn within and blame themselves and don't understand that that's actually just a byproduct of grieving. And so then that begs the question, so what do we do with this? And you've already showed it. Go back to the beginning of the video and watch how you listen for listen to that other voice, find that other voice inside, and the guidance will flow. So we have access to the guidance once you get past the anger and the sadness, right? That's the hardest thing for me to both believe and to um, come to terms with is that the guidance comes. Because it doesn't, you know, why would that happen? But it does. And I just, I see it again and again and again. And even when I'm struggling to understand my own uh, efforts, uh, for example, uh, with mediumship and such as that, um, that, you know, and for, for those who are listening, who are struggling, you know, is this stuff really real or not? Or am I just kind of making this up to, you know, Ask for guidance. Ask for validation. And, you know, that, that, uh, this isn't a, a, a sort of off topic, but um, uh, my uh, wife, uh, her when her mother died, uh, they, uh, uh, they, uh, they buried her and, you know, they cremated her. And then each family member had her ashes for, a couple of years, and then they finally decided that they would inter the ashes. And so uh, my wife um, and our sister, she has three sisters, they all went off and they did this. And, uh, you know, I, I was at home alone. And I had the perception that uh, Carol's mother was in the house with me. And uh, the, the perception was so great that I actually looked all around the house you know, feeling kind of silly and self-conscious, you know, am I really is this real? You know, showing her uh, like the various pictures that we had put up and walking all around the house. And then we went out in the backyard and I even adjusted the, uh, we have like this spinning peacock in the backyard. And uh, I had the perception that the Carol's mother didn't like where it was. So I moved it to a different place and all this sort of thing. But the whole time I did wonder, is this just, you know, if, but then I just asked. I said, you know, uh, is this real? You know, is this, you know, is this something? And Carol's mother took me to a piece of furniture in the house and pointed to it and said, or not, you know, at least what I heard was, talk to my daughter about this and you'll know this is real. <laughs> but it didn't happen until I asked, until I said, is this real? And then I was guided. And I just see, and sure enough, that piece of furniture had special meaning to uh, my wife that, uh, you know, I've been unaware of, and it did verify the experience. But I think that if people are, are struggling to understand that this is real, ask for validation. And I've seen it happen again and again that then it comes, usually comes in a way that only means something to the individual. It often doesn't mean anything if we tell you know if we tell it to others oh this is the proof that it was real yeah. usually it doesn't mean anything except to the person who needs to understand it right so beautiful lesson always saying just ask just ask so outstanding wisdom about anger versus grief what's really going underneath what's on at the surface and how to deal with that what else is on your sheet that we don't want to miss for the anger you know, just again and again and again to hear that um so I guess the final word you guess I have uh, for you um is when I was really wondering who oh, this were can it really be true that just a minute or three minutes or five minutes, of paying attention to your own thought stream and learning to just identify what is your inner voice and then as you who's the observer and then wondering 
who is the observer and that wondering who is there with me. It is interesting uh, that, you know, we think of meditation as, as coming from uh, Buddhism. I, I, as an aside, uh, Christian thought also is very, uh, has a very strong meditative uh, tradition. They called it contemplation. You know, thousands of years ago, made this exact point in which he said, he said, how did I achieve enlightenment? How did I achieve these things? He said, and he said to his monks, why am I teaching you this? And he said, it's as simple as self-awareness. And he described that a first process is not some, you know, complex meditative technique that needs to be, uh, you know, uh, learned and, you know, and the, the Buddha describes a process very similar to what you've outlined. Uh, uh, you know, watched your uh, YouTube video. It's, it's almost word for word uh, what the Buddha originally described. And uh, from what I'm sharing with you today, that it's just a matter of listening to oneself and learning to organize and sort out your thoughts. And that in that process, the wisdom will come to you. That it's as simple as what we were saying earlier, is that suddenly when you hear everything, and you understand that you hear the screaming in the cell next door, and you hear the gurgling in your stomach, and you hear your own doubts, and your anger and your grief, and then suddenly, something else intrudes and that's the beginning of wisdom what more could we add to that i knew this would be special and truly it is uh thank you very much i wouldn't uh I wouldn't ask to go through your experiences for anything. And yet other people looked at me and say, I wouldn't go through what you went through with your stepdaughter dying. And we can look at, at, at every one of us. There's some, some pain that we go through. The lessons we learn aren't, they don't have to be painful for us to learn, but look at what you've learned and now sharing with others as a result of these lessons. I, I would not change anything in my life. No, no, I regret the mistakes I made, and yet I see them all as part of my process. Well, everybody, I, I hope that you felt Dr. Melvin Morse's heart the way I did that night at the IANS conference, and I hope that, it, that what he has shared today has helped you to go into your heart and be willing to take a closer look Thank you so much, Melvin. What an honor. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, everybody. Watch this one again and again. Uh, I know I will. Meanwhile, go out, have a great week, and, and be the presence of love for everyone who shows up in your life. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, everybody. You know, one of the most common comments I get from people when we talk about the spirit world is, I'm not coming back. Well, I have news for you. We come back again and again for the joy of it, for the soul. If you haven't had enough joy in your life, I invite you to join me on my upcoming Awakened Way Mediterranean Odyssey. We're gonna be diving into the Awakened Way concepts that show how you can up-level yourself from the restricted sense of self to the expanded point of view of you as an eternal soul. We're going to have extended time together with me and with the collective consciousness known as Sanaya. I'll be doing guided meditations that are channeled and Sanaya will be conversing with all of you. I can't wait to hear what they have to say. I can't wait for you to feel their energy. Yes, we're going to have some deep conversations about those things that keep us in only human mode, but I'm going to show you, you are far more than only human. You're gonna have a chance to connect with your own higher self and with your loved ones who have crossed the veil, not to mention your guides and even higher beings. But don't worry, we won't take ourselves too seriously. Who is that guy? In addition to our time together during the workshop sessions, we're going to be visiting some of my favorite places on earth, starting out in Spain, going to France, Italy, Malta, Greece, and Turkey. 
But don't take my word for how awesome this cruise is gonna be. I'd like you to hear from some of those who went on my Alaska cruise with me last year. Wow, it was amazing. I'd never done anything like this before, kinda had sworn off cruises. Being with over 500 other kindred spirits, feeling so much love and so much oneness was truly a life-changing experience for me. It was fantastic. I think the highlights were meeting Suzanne and participating in her amazing workshops where she provides us with so much information and um, just the energy of the group that she engendered um, and brought, brought together was wonderful to be part of. And we went on Suzanne's Awakened Way cruise to Alaska and it was just incredible. We had the best time. The real highlights for me were the friends that I made, um, some wonderful people that I met and so many people who have lost so much but find ways to be joyful in life and just by being there they teach us so much and taught me so much. And it was amazing to meet all these like-minded people. Yes, you know, you have an in-person, you have this amazing community, but for a week, uh, I just, I can't tell you how much fun it was to be with these people that were just, and watching Suzanne on that boat, <laughs> on the stage, um, she sparkled and I feel like everybody just entrained to that high vibration. And it was just amazing. Hi everyone. I had the privilege of going on Suzanne Beastman's Awaken Way through to Alaska. The energy of Suzanne, the energy from my fellow Awaken Way cruisers came together to form this incredible, inspirational, over the moon experience. Uh, the energy on that boat was unbelievable uh, and everything is uplifting. Suzanne taught me that I am life, which stands for love and full expression. And it's my job to read the love and the joy and the energy, not only to everyone I meet in the world, but to myself as well. It was an amazing experience. I loved it and I'm still carrying that energy to this day, months later. If you're ready for more details, or maybe you're ready to sign up and join us, go to my homepage, scroll down to where you see the Awaken Way banner and click learn more. Are we on, on spot for a uh... Mediterranean tour in 2024. We're in, man. High five. Bring it. <laughs>